In between the sixth and seventh seal, God slows down uh, and offers us this interlude of hope that in the midst of these judgment cycles, he is promising that his protection and his provision and his promises to bring all things to his purposes and his ends and us into glory are absolutely sure and certain. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Would you please stand if you are able as we read together and listen intently together to God's inerrant word from Revelation chapter 10. And then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head and his face was like the sun, his legs like pillars of fire and he had a little scroll open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and he called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring and when he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it and earth and what is in it and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. And then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go and take the scroll that is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. And so I went to the angel and told him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth, it will be sweet as honey. And so I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it. It was sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. This is the word of the Lord. And please be seated. I have this little prayer book called Valley of Vision. It's a pretty popular little prayer book that I pray through all the time that I give to people as a gift because in the midst of praying these prayers, they're being literally taught the gospel and taught the, the truths of God's salvation. And, and one of the things, it was, it's, a, it's, a group, it's a collection of prayers from the Puritans. And the Puritans have a bad rap. Everybody thinks the Puritans... We're just a bunch of sour-faced nincompoops who just wanted to wreck everybody's party and lock you up in stocks in the town square for the slightest infraction. But the reality is that when you read, really read the Puritans, they, one, one big thing I've learned from them is that they were very joyful people. They were rejoicing kind of people. However, they were able to, one of the secrets of the Christian life that I learned from the Puritans was that they had a good understanding of a balance between the bitter and the sweet in the Christian life. And that's hard to strike that balance. There are some churches that are just hyper-focused on the sweet. The kind of churches that are kind of Christians, you know, that just declare victory over everything, declaring victory over career, victory over relationships, victory over breakfast, Whatever it is, they're just declaring victory over everything. And Christianity to them means that everything is sweet, everything is successful, and everything is a win. We are going to be living that best life. And if not, it's because you don't have enough faith. There's a problem with that. I mean, I I love, that's a part of me that loves that, right? Because as a church planner, uh, you know, that draws a lot of people, so that's always a temptation, but I love the hype. I love the hype. Man, I spent like the first half of my year of my life like creating hype (laughs) in in rock bands. I wish Pascal was here today, you know, to say amen to that, but I love that kind of hype when we're just winning and everything was just crushing everything in life and we're crushing Christianity and crushing life through it. But the problem is that that doesn't really, what happens when the inevitable defeat comes? How does your theology even handle that? It's a great system for people who are always type A 
super driven, semi-sociopathic maybe, but <laughs> it's not such a great system for the rest of us in real life who suffer defeat and don't know victory. But on the other hand, we can err on the other side of the spectrum and just hyper-focus on the bitter. And, and let me just say it out loud, our tradition, Reformed tradition, we're kind of, we can specialize in that. We're just sinners and we're depraved and your hearts are awful and depraved and all you can do is sin, sin, sin and praise God that Jesus would even look at a miserable worm like me. We can totally go the other direction and just focus on the bitterness of life, on the hardship of it, with a secret, the truth, one of the truths of the Christian life and the reality presented in this passage is that the Christian life is bittersweet. That's the reality. It's bitter and it's sweet. Uh, and there's a tension. There's a tension in that. And God calls us to have this great joy in the midst of tribulation and suffering. And that's what this passage is really all about. The big idea is that Jesus is with us and he is fulfilling his promise to save through the bittersweet reality of this age. And Jesus is with us, and he is fulfilling his promise to save through the bittersweet reality of this age. So let's look at that one part at, at a time. First, that Jesus is with us. This whole coronavirus outbreak's got everybody thinking about germs. We don't usually think about germs, but I'm thinking about germs. I'm like on Amazon trying to buy N95 masks and suits and, you know, gloves and, and glasses. For, I'm trying to find like kid size, you know, protective glasses and N95 masks so that we can all bundle up and lock ourselves down in the house if we need to. Most of the time, I don't ever think about germs. But I, you know, in the midst of this, I decided to do some research and there's, I discovered there are, Scientists now think there's over a trillion different kinds of microbes in the world. Only 1% of them are harmful, but that means that 10 billion microbes are, are harmful. And there's 320,000 viruses that we know that are all bad, that, all, that affect mammals. And as we're finding out, some of them have the ability to cross over species. We are, we are literally living in a sea of tiny killing machines, and we never ever think about it. There's just the great scene in, in, uh, in the, in the biography, movie about Howard Hughes called The Aviator, or Howard Hughes's uh, friend, the movie star Ava Gardner, is in his apartment where he's locked himself down and he's such a germaphobe that he's afraid to touch anything. And Ava Gardner is in there washing everything before she serves him any food and he's afraid to touch it. And he's like, he's, it's like, it's not clean, it's not clean. And Ava says, nothing's really clean, Howard, but we do our best. She was right. She was right. We live in a sea of tiny killing monsters, tiny nanomachines, uh, and we never, ever give it a second thought, really. And the reason is why? Because there's something that stands between us as a wall between all those microbes and illness, and that is the, the stunning immune system of the human being that is able to create a shield and a wall around us that, that protects us from all of those unseen dangers in a way that we never really even have to think about it. And the same is true with Jesus. Jesus is constantly surrounding us and protecting us, whether we know it or not, whether we realize it or not. Um, listen to verses one through three. And then I saw a mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun, his legs pillars like fire. He had a little scroll open in his hand. He set his right foot on the sea, his left on the land, and he called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. Who is this? Who is this angel? Let's look at the clues. He's wrapped in a cloud. Jesus is the only person described as coming on the clouds of heaven. 
He has a rainbow over his head, which is a typical feature of the prophetic visions of the Old Testament of Yahweh. The glory of Yahweh, the Shekinah glory, is a shimmering, shining essence like a rainbow that surrounds God. Uh, his face is like the sun, which is a description of the exalted Jesus from Revelation chapter 1. He's got the little scroll in his hand that he was given in chapter 5. His feet are on the land and the sea, denoting sovereignty over all of creation, and he calls out with a voice that's like a lion. It doesn't take, it doesn't take, it's, it's not a big stretch to understand who they're talking about. This is a picture of Jesus. But there's one feature that shows us how Jesus, that Jesus, that's meant to teach us that Jesus is protecting us, and that is that his legs are like pillars of fire. Now think for a minute, where else do we see a pillar of fire? We think back to the Exodus. We see a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke that guided Israel all throughout the wilderness wanderings. In fact, it showed up right away when the Egyptians were crowding them, the Israelites into the sea. And there was really, they were totally trapped. There was no hope. God came down in a pillar of fire and smoke and positioned himself in between the Israelites on the edge of the sea and Pharaoh's army protecting them. And then wherever they went from that point forward, that cloud would provide shade and the pillar of fire would provide light. God's provision would rain down with manna and food and give them everything that they needed and protect them from the elements and from all harm all throughout the entire wilderness wanderings. And so what is this doing? It's trying to bring our attention back to that image of Exodus and remembering that the Exodus story is like a physical representation of the whole story of salvation. That just like God rescued the Israelites from the slavery of the Egyptians, Jesus is leading a new exodus, saving us from the slavery of sin and death. And this picture of his legs like a pillar of fire is meant to teach us and, and reassure us in this interlude of hope that Jesus is with us that he's guiding us, he is protecting us, and he is providing for us all through the wilderness of this evil age. It's meant to reassure us. Well, the problem is, if you're anything like me, my first response is like, okay, I know that. But man, it sure would help if there was like a big old pillar of fire right in front of the church that like followed us around. If there was something that I could see then I, would, then I would be able to know for sure that God is with us, protecting us. Then I would know, I would totally understand and, and believe it. If I could just have some kind of sign. Let me tell you a true story. <laughs> I don't exactly know how to put this in my, in what box in my theology to put this, but here it is. When I was 20, I'm gonna tell, maybe I'm gonna tell two stories. We'll see. When I was 20, Ish. Uh, I was. I had met uh, a family uh, who were Christians, and the father was witnessing to me. And one night, we were in the jacuzzi. They lived on the edge of the Del Mar Valley, on the north edge of the Del Mar Valley, looking down into you know what was then you know just nothing, right? And so the stars were out. It was a beautiful night. We're sitting in the jacuzzi, right on the edge of this giant hillside. And he's talking to me about Jesus. He's telling me about the gospel. And I said to myself, in my head, I'm just thinking to myself, and I'm praying, and I ask God, I say, God, if, if this is true, would you just give me a sign? And right when I said sign, a meteorite came out of the sky, the biggest meteorite I've ever seen in my life. It seemed so close, I could see, almost see the flame and the smoke trail behind it went right through the Dermot Valley. Take it for what you want, right? <laughs> well, here's the point. It took me less than six months to convince myself that that never even happened. <laughs> Not just that it was a coincidence. I mean, that I had made it up in my mind, right? And what's the point? The point is that the seeing, the seeing doesn't really help just like we talked about, you know, um, 
last week, seeing the miracles of Jesus had almost zero effect on bringing people into salvation. It was the Holy Spirit moving in people's hearts. Uh, and in the same way, just the seeing isn't the thing. The thing isn't what we can see. The thing isn't whether we can see it or not. The thing is whether or not our hearts are willing to trust what we know to be true. Intellectually, we all know, you're all good Christians, you all know that Jesus is protecting us in and through this age in ways that we can't understand or know. But when it comes down to it, the reason we have such a hard time with it is because we don't trust his protection. We don't trust his provision because things happen that we don't like, things don't happen that we really want to happen, and we say to ourselves, where's God in all this? How could God allow this to happen to me? Why isn't God giving, providing for me these, these things that I so desperately want? And the answer to that is, is that we believe that God is providing, every, if God is present with us, that his power is with us, it means that, that everything that happens that we don't like and everything that doesn't happen, that we want to happen, is all part of God's ordained good for us. And so one of the big secrets of the Christian life is, it's the question that you ask when that happens. You can ask yourself, why, God, why has God done this to me? Or you can ask yourself, what is God trying to teach me? How is God trying to grow me? And by asking those questions, then we can enter into what God is actually doing and begin to reap the benefits. Uh, learning how to trust God in the bitterness is one of the pathways into the sweetness. Amen? Okay, I gotta tell the story. My cousin, my cousin's visiting today. When I was 20 years old also, talking about God protecting us in ways that we never ever even know or think about. I had got a motorcycle when I was 20 and one day my cousin shows up at my door. And, you know, we didn't, we were real close when we were growing up. We hadn't seen each other a lot. I knew she was a Christian. <laughs> uh, you know, so I knew I needed to keep some distance between us for safety. She shows up at my door one day, she knocks on the door, and she's got a motorcycle helmet. And she's like, look, I know you're going to think this is super weird. God spoke to me and told me to give you this motorcycle helmet. Do with it what you want. And I'm like, hey, thanks. That's so sweet. <laughs> <clears throat> I took the motorcycle helmet, went inside, put it on my bed. Didn't think about it for weeks. One day, for no good reason, I decided... I'm going to give that helmet a try one day today. I'm going to try it today, see if it's all that bad. This is before helmet laws. Put the helmet on. I'm out on my motorcycle. Car pulls in front of me. I T-bone this car. I go right through the windshield. My, helmet, my head literally punches a hole in the windshield. And I flip out on the other side like a, like a circus act and land on my feet like, ta-da! <laughs> and my helmet's gone. I look around. The helmet's stuck in the car windshield. And I'm thinking to myself, that could be my head. Because the point of the story is because you're here. I want to tell the story. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's a great story. But listen, God, God is protecting us in so many ways that you don't even know or don't even think about. Like that was an easy one to pick out, right? That was an easy one to pick out. But every day as we go through life, God is protecting us and shielding us from just myriad things that you never even know about, much less the things that you do. And if that's true then the things that he allows to come through the filter, you can also guarantee, you can trust that those things are for your good, that those things are from him to grow you, to strengthen you, to bring you into the sweetness. And so ask the right questions. Don't ask, why is God doing this to me? Like the Israelites, oh God, you've brought us here in San Diego to die. <laughs> no, he hasn't. He's brought us here to this church to grow. And to, and, to, and to share in the beauty and the blessing of spreading and sharing the gospel with other people and seeing his kingdom expand. 
Okay, point two. <laughs> wow. Point two, Jesus is with us, fulfilling his promise to save. Uh, last couple of weeks ago, I told you about a funny joke about how, you know, we were talking about giving to the church, and I talked about that Babylon Bee article that talked about, you know, church board suspicious about pastor's extravagant purchase of 2007 Corolla. It was funny because Nisa actually had a 2007 Corolla. Well, we actually, we, praise God, we got rid of the Corolla and we bought Nisa a new car. So now I'm really going to be in trouble with the elders, right? Uh, and as part of the car buying process, what happens? You're in, you're like negotiating with these car salesmen. You get the first salesman, right? And if you start to bulldoze them, then the heavy comes in and then the heavier guy comes in. And they're all just like, they're all just like spinning these different angles at you to like dis, you know, to, to discombobulate you to disorient you. So you like forget where you're at and then, and it's all like deception. And then they break out at the end this three foot long contract (laughs) that's got everything stipulated in it. And most of it's like governed by law because they know like how dirty the whole business is. And why, why is that? Because culturally, we expect the breaking of a promise. We expect the loophole. We expect the default. There's like, whenever a contract is done, there are teams of lawyers who sit around and like think, and they get paid to think about every possible way somebody could like default on this contract to break their promise. And so we come to expect that. We come to expect the breaking of promises, but God is completely different than that. He's not like us. You know, some people... Sometimes philosophers will try to trick theologians into, you know, if God is all-powerful, can, uh, can he make a rock that even he can't lift? Dumb things like that. Uh, and trying to, like, you know, trying to get you to admit there's some things that God can't do, therefore he's not all-powerful. The reality is there are some things God cannot do because of his character. His very nature is truth. It's not even possible for him to lie. It's not even possible for him to break a promise or an oath to us. And what does this, what does this angel, what does Jesus do when he comes down and he sets his feet on the earth in sovereignty? What does he do? He makes an oath. He makes a promise. Listen to this. He takes a public oath for us all to see In verses five and seven, and the angel who I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, and earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, that there would be no more delay, but that the days, in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled just as he announced to his servants the prophets. What is the oath? The oath is, Jesus promises that there would be no more delay. And we can see a trigger. We can see triggers in the text as to why that is. The last chapter that we read ended last week. What, how did it end? It said that even after God in his patience at counting a thousand years as a day and a day as a thousand years after millennia of long suffering with humanity and offering, you know, offering the offer of salvation and even bringing, tempor- you know, even bringing limited judgment as a way to like wake people up to the, real- to the reality of God. Even after all that, people refused to repent. There's a, a level reached of intractable unbelief and rebellion against God And not only that, that's the first trigger. The second trigger is that all of his people have been gathered in. We see in chapter six, the saints ask this very same question in the interlude between the sixth seal and the seventh seal. They say, how long, O Lord? How long until you bring all this to an end? And at that point, God says, just a little while longer. Until when? Until all of your brothers have come in. Paul reinforces that in 
Romans chapter 11, 25, he says that there's going to come a time when the fullness of the Gentiles have come in and that is going to be a trigger for God bringing everything to an end. Which means that at some point in time, someone is going to get saved and that's going to be it. Who knows the number? We don't know the time. What we do know is that there's a definite number of God's people that he has foreordained to bring into his church. And when that is completed, and when the, when the unbelief and rebellion against, of the world against God in the face of unrelenting mercy has reached a certain level, God shuts it down. That's the end. It's judgment. And that's... That's what he says will not delay. But he also says what will no longer delay is the mystery of God. It'll be fulfilled. And what's the mystery of God? Mystery. Mystery, basically, mystery doesn't lay in like we mean. We mean mystery. We're like, well, I guess we'll never know. You know? Like the mystery of like where all my cell phones go or my keys. I don't have any idea. Mystery in the, in the Bible is something that was revealed but not fully understood that has now come to light in surprising and unique ways. And what the, what's surprising in the old, and what he says is, he gives us a hint here as to what this mystery is. He says, the mystery is what was announced by his servants, the prophets. And that word announced, you know what that word is? Bible scholars, euangelion. It's the word, it's the word um, evangel. It's the good news. It's the gospel. He's saying the prophets throughout all the Old Testament were prophesying this, the gospel message that this covenant that God had with Israel to forgive their sins and to cleanse them and save them through the Messiah would at one point in time branch out and go throughout the entire world bringing this message of free salvation in the sacrifice of Jesus and that as it goes, it went throughout the world, God would be drawing his people in, drawing his people in. He's answering the prayers of the saints in chapter six. It's not any longer just a little while. He's saying, there's no more delay. That's happening now. All of God's people have been brought in and it's time for judgment. What's, what's, a, what's important, one of, one of the biggest thing that's important about that for us to understand is that that is Jesus making a public oath to fulfill every promise that he has made to us from the Old Testament into the New Testament to the church and not just to the church in an abstract way to every single one of us. God has promised that what he's began in you, he will finish. And this is Jesus swearing, making a formal oath in public that he will fulfill that promise. It's absolutely sure. But here's the thing. We see promises like that and we all become like covenant lawyers. <laughs> we all start looking for the loophole. Okay. But, 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 but what if I'm not good enough? What if I too big a sinner? What if I'm not holy enough? What if I don't, what if there's like a percentage of righteousness and I don't quite hit it? What if it's 81% and I get an 80? What? We start becoming lawyers and we start looking through the promises to see how it might not, might not apply out of fear. And I don't want to discount the real warnings in the book of Revelation. I mean, that is the big chunk of the book. There's a, it's talking about a time at the end when a huge swath of the church uh, has compromised true Christianity to, to a form of Christianity that has the name but really just looks like the values and the ethics and the beliefs of the world surrounding us. Uh, and that's a real warning and a real danger. If you have subscribed to a form of Christianity that's, uh, you know, that's 
10 or 20 years new and completely disregards the ethical teachings of the church for millennia, you should be worried. Conversely, if your theology is perfect and on point and you hate everyone, you should worry. (sighs) But if you're worried about that stuff, if you're really worried about your sin, if you're worried about pleasing God, if it does something that does break your heart, then that's the best evidence in the world that you truly belong to him and that these promises are, in fact, for you. And so a better way to go about this is what Jesus says. To be like kids. Just take him at face value. You know, what more does he need to do? (laughs) It's a pretty clear promise He goes out of his way to present this image and give us this vision of him standing over the earth, making a sworn oath by God that he's going to bring you through and he's going to save you. No matter what happens, his promise is sure to bring you through to the end. And that's a good thing to remember on those days when you're not feeling very saved, which happens like on Monday morning, right? Our salvation is not based on our percentage of goodness, our righteousness, our works. It's it's founded in God's covenantal oath to us, which he is not even capable of breaking. And that's a pretty sure foundation. Way sure foundation than what you're able to pull off. Amen? The last, last part. Jesus is with us. He's fulfilling his promise to save and he's doing it through the bittersweet reality of this age. Let's look at verse nine and 10. And so I went to the angel and told him, give me the little scroll. He said to me, take and eat it for it'll make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the hand of the angel and ate it and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, My stomach was made bitter. Jesus tells John straight up, the revelation of this mystery, the revelation of the reality of the gospel going out through the earth and its culmination and completion is gonna be a bittersweet reality. That's just true. It's bitter because we see, we see through the judgment cycles that In a large part, the message that we're trying to bring to the world is going to be rejected by most people. And not just rejected, but actively suppressed in a way that's going to hurt us. And that's bitter. And even even on top of that is uh, the bitterness of the loss of the lost. There's going to be huge swaths of humanity that we will watch trade in eternal joy for temporal trinkets. And any attempt on our part to pull them out of that will be met with hostility. And that is a bitter reality to stomach, especially if it's somebody you love, somebody you care for. But it's also sweet that in the midst of that hardship and bitterness, we have a a nearness with God promised us. We've been given his spirit so that we are communing with him. And he's assuring us of his promises. He's strengthening us in the spirit so that we can operate uh, and, and begin to participate in the expansion of his kingdom and see people who do receive the faith and see people who do come in and receive Christ and begin to honor him. Uh, and we have the promises that, that all of this, this is really, all of this is really temporal. And at the end of it, there is an inheritance that we've been promised. We have won the spiritual lottery. Like I said in another sermon, we are all uh, trust fund kids, the king of heaven. <laughs> we just gotta wait till we graduate. We get a certain age and we get to enter into the wealth of heaven is co-heirs with Jesus, and that's a sweet and wonderful thing. And so that calls us to practice 
a couple of spiritual disciplines. The first one we talked about already, the spiritual discipline of trusting God in the bitterness, trusting that that is God's goodness to us uh, and remaining, remaining faithful in it and trusting that God is blessing us through that. But the other, the other important discipline and something that, that we, I think, our tradition we need to practice better is revisiting the sweetness. <laughs> is revisiting the sweetness. Because it can be, when, you know, it's so easy for that bitterness to overtake you and for it to become your identity. That the bitterness begins to define us as a people. And we're never going to get away from the bitterness in this life. Like we said last week, the golden age starts when Jesus returns and not a second sooner. However, we can practice the discipline of revisiting the sweetness through all the, the means of grace that God has given us, coming to church, hearing the word preached, receiving the Lord's Supper, praying, fellowship, devotion, meditation on the word, just saturating and renewing our minds every day about the goodness and promises of God, about his protection, his provision in the wilderness, his promises that are sure and certain, our growing relationship with him now as we get, become more intimate and more intimate with him in and through all the bitterness. And in that, we just remind ourselves of the sweetness and begin to live in the sweetness in a way that helps us be balanced. We don't disregard or hype everything out so much that we just try to bury the bitterness under the, under the rug. We acknowledge it, but it, it's not our defining reality. Our defining reality is the sweetness of salvation, the sweetness of the gospel, and the inestimable privilege of being to participate in that in the world. And that's pretty sweet. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is truly sweet. Your promises are so good that we, uh, we would never have made them up. We would never have been able to think all that up on our own, Lord. There would always be a catch or something that we had to do, some standard we had to fulfill. And we thank you, Lord, that you were perfect and became man and fulfilled the whole standard for us, give us our right, your righteousness as a gift. Cleanse us from our sin. Adopt us into your family as sons and just rejoice over us. And so, Lord, we acknowledge there's bitterness and hardship in the world. We pray, Lord, especially for our friends, family, who don't know you, those who have walked away from the faith, those who have been suckered into a false version of Christianity that appeals to their desires. Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you would restore them. We pray that you would save them, bring them into the joy of eternal life. Lord, as we do that, we can't help but be reminded of how fortunate we are to know you, to have been brought into this reality, to have your spirit to be able to, to be given the privilege of calling you Father with everything that that implies, to rejoice as your children, and to have a, a positive expectation, a sure expectation of real hope. Things are going to get better. And not only better, so good our minds can't even comprehend them now. So help us to live in that sweetness. And help us to praise you and be grateful as we ought to be in Jesus' name. Amen.